Greetings, friends. It's Michael Parker, and welcome back to Michael Parker Media. And today we are joined in the studio, Mr. or Sir Blake Sinclair. He's coming to us from the San Francisco area. And I was referred to Sir Blake by a mutual friend, and it was fortuitous because as many of you know, right now we are undergoing the the week to 10 days of the Lunar New Year celebration. So I thought it would be interesting to have a bit of a discussion on that because those of us who grew up in the West, we may not fully understand what this is all about. Blake Sinclair is a licensed occupational therapist, a writer, an entrepreneur. He has used his diverse background in Western and Eastern techniques and his connection to the divine for the last 25 years in the rehabilitation healthcare industry to facilitate healing processes for his clients. And he is coming to us, as I said, from the San Francisco Bay Area. Sir Blake, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Well, I'm glad you're here. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about Chinese astrology, about healing, because you've studied many modalities. You've studied under many different masters and traditions. Far too much for us to talk about in this one hour. So we're going to just kind of focus on the Chinese tradition today. First of all, tell us about yourself, because I understand that you grew up in Chinatown in San Francisco, and I think you had a bit of a rough childhood, which influenced your desire to become a healer. Yeah, I was born and raised in San Francisco in Chinatown. I was born in the Chinese hospital. That's the same hospital where Bruce Lee was born. Mm. And... Yeah, it's, it was a wonderful growing up in Chinatown. It's like you, you've got everything there. You got the some of the greatest martial artists was there, and a lot of uh, herbalists are there. So it's a it's a beautiful place to be to grow up. A little bit tough there, and I think that a lot of factors affected me in being who I am today as a as a healer. And I think it's just being in that Chinese family, being in that culture uh, affects you in that way. So when you go to Chinatown, you see the herbal stores, you see all the herbs. And my mother would bring me to Chinatown, go shopping for herbs for soup. And then my grandma was from the old school. So when we get sick, they would give us certain herbs to take, like goji berry or licorice to help with our health and wellness. And so I'm kind of exposed to that at home. And then you, you see acupuncturists, and then you see what they do. And even my martial art master, he's a, a famous martial art master, grandmaster, Y.C. Wong. In fact, he, he's still there. I mean, he's, he was there when I was young. He does a kind of a bakwa martial art that keeps his longevity. And he's still very active in his martial art studio in San Francisco to this very day. And it's just amazing to see these people and what they do. You try to figure out. And, he's, and I used to watch him take care of people. People come to him. He would rehabilitate them and give them herbs and supplements to heal them. So you see that. And so that kind of gets into my psyche. And growing up in an Asian American family is very difficult during the 60s. Back then, the, the parents are really strict and it's hard for them to show love. And so it's like you got to work hard, earn a lot, a big, good living, become a doctor or a lawyer or a computer programmer, something that makes a lot of money. And, you know, I was always, always compared to my relative my cousin, who was much smarter, is, why can't you be like this guy? Mm -hmm. And of course, so that, that puts a heavy stress on me growing up as a child. And uh, that, I think it was hard because also the parents back then, it's hard for them to show their emotions. Not like nowadays, everybody's hugging and loving. You know, and back in the 60s, there, there wasn't a whole lot of that love and affection. And, and so it was difficult being in that kind of environment. And it was a kind of chaotic environment to grow up in. And uh, so it affected me. I got a lot of stress. I became depressed. I became very shy and I was very sick. And I think that was the perfect storm to push me to almost lead me to like a burnout. And I was a meltdown process, you know, and I, I felt like I wasn't getting that support. So then I, I felt like I said, what am I doing here? So at one point I, I contemplated about ending my life as a young adult because you know, you, all you do is get the disciplinary actions and it's judgment constantly. And so I, I broke down. But fortunately, my mother was able to release that ego and she cried. And that uh, really affected me because I saw the love that come out, come out of her. And that's something I never saw from her before. But I mean, now as an adult, I look back and I realize they love me. But it's just hard back then coming from the old school. You know, we were raised a certain way and they were raised a certain way. But I realized that, you know, she was doing things in, in her own way to love me. 
and that kind of motivated me, inspired me to work hard to end my suffering. I was suffering. I was so internally preoccupied. I was so sick all the time. And I don't want to be that anymore. But I, I wanted to make a difference because yeah, I was suffering too much. I didn't want to be that way anymore. I don't like, like being a normal person. Yeah. Um, what was it that you were suffering from? I mean, I know that a lot of these things can be caused by our own emotional issues, which we will talk about because it's in your book. But what was the actual, were you fatigued? Did you, were you fluey? What was your sickness that you were undergoing? Everything. I had asthma, I had trouble breathing. Yeah. I had that very often. Uh, I would get colds all the time, migraine headaches. And emotionally, it was a very anxious, depressed, anger, angry, very angry person. So I kind of internalized that. So I blame myself for everything. So I had a very low self-esteem. So you have all this internal dynamics and it's hard for me to even think. I go to school, I can't even concentrate. I had a learning disorder. I went to watch a movie or listen to the lecture and I couldn't hear it. All I hear was like this cartoon, like the Charlie Brown, and you go, bop, 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 bop. all I hear the sound like that, but I couldn't really process it. It took many years of work to navigate through all that. You know, when I was young, I was in school, I used to feel like a school dummy because I was not smart. That's why I felt so bad at one point in my life. But I worked really hard to make a difference. I said, hey, you know what? If I can make a difference, you know, and prove it to other people who are in my same circumstance, that people like us, we can make it. We work really, really hard. So I spent my life after that working really hard for many years, checking out everything from the Western field, I mean, the medical field, uh, alternative therapy, holistic, the Chinese systems, all the systems so that are holistic and everything evolved me and got me to improve mentally, emotionally, physically. So, and then eventually it led me to a spiritual path that completely healed me completely. So I changed like 360 degrees, like twice. So the person I was before is no longer there. I'm, I'm a different person. I've evolved in a bigger uh, way, consciously and emotionally, physically stronger. Well, you mentioned that your grandmother, you would go with her to purchase herbs for healing and things. And I guess what I'm what I'm trying to imagine in my mind is that there is the Chinese culture that you grew up with, but there's also the American culture. And what was the schism in the home life? How much did your parents reflect the Chinese customs versus this American, you're just going to work hard and... Uh, was there a lot of the Asian influence in your life as a child or no? You know, I, I don't think so. Not not too much right. because uh, my, my yeah. parents wanted me to integrate. Sure. I mean, but then my grandmother, of course, she tried to keep some, of the, keep some of the tradition with the food and things like that. Fortunately, I had some neighbors who were Taoists and they would sometimes invite me to go to the Taoist temple. Sometimes we have Buddhist temples. I'll try to visit that. So there's some of it. I mean, we have like New Year's. We get the red envelope, lucky money, some real basic stuff. And my mom, throughout my life, she would teach me about Confucianism. Mm -hmm. So there, there was some guidance. But my mom's idea was to put me in Chinese school and also put me into like a martial arts school. So I learned, I would go to the, my regular school and then go to Chinese school and then go to martial arts to learn Kung Fu. And then I also studied to play some of the Chinese instrument. So a lot of stuff I had to learn on my own. Because my mom was actually pretty Americanized and she's from China. Mm -hmm. Through the years, my, my father was born in San Francisco, but through the years, he became more Chinese than my mother. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> oh, that's that's interesting, because I, I know that the older I get, the more I reflect the traditions that I grew up with, the same traditions I was trying to get away from, you know, when I was young. And but it's part of our emotional DNA. But let's let's return to this. So the the Chinese Lunar New Year, I'm in Los Angeles, you were in San Francisco, we have a large Chinatown like you do. And it is a big thing here. And I've gone a couple of times, but explain what the significance of the wooden dragon 2024 year is. Well, the wooden dragon, is, uh, the dragon is very significant. Yes, It's like the most um, popular, most famous uh, creature. Yes. They call it a mythical being. It's not a real animal, but it's a very good sign to be born in that year. And although some people say it's mythical, there are a lot of people who believe in dragons. And right. I'm here to tell you that it goes back so many thousands of years in China that there was a dragon there. And there's and you see artwork with a dragon going after a pearl. The dragon represents the emperor. 
And the pearl is actually a real pearl that was given to the emperor. So when we go back in time, we go back in time to the yellow emperor, and even people will say that he's a mythical character. Mm -hmm. But I actually uh, presented at a Taoist conference, and I met the direct descendant of the yellow emperor. And I, I uh, was presenting about mysticism. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, well, you, you thank him in the beginning of the book. I am not going to try to say the man's name. So if you could say it for the audience. Oh, his name, the, the direct descendant is the Grandmaster Zhang Yuan Ming. He lives in Southern California. And so his he's a direct lineage. He goes back so many thousands of years. And in fact, he had a trip one time. He brought his uh, assistant and some people to go back to China to the area of the cave where the Yellow Emperor did his spiritual practices and the cultivation. So the story with this Yellow Emperor, he's the one that's responsible for bringing China together as a one country. And he was a very spiritual person. You know, he taught the feng shui, he taught qi gong, and there was even a book about the Yellow Emperor Inner Canyon, and it has a lot of medical information that set the foundation for like, traditional Chinese medicine for later on. And during towards the end of his life, he attained ascension, liberation. And the story has it that he rode off on a dragon. And before he rode off into ascension, he was given seven dragon pearls. And these are mystical pearls. They're not from the planet Earth. There's some outer space, extraterrestrial crystal balls. And they were given to him. And he, before he left, he gave it to his grandson. They kept it in the family for thousands of years. So he he brought it to that conference. I didn't see it there. I met him afterwards at a banquet, like a VIP banquet for the guests. And I got invited to it. And I sat down and I saw this guy with a robe, yellow robe. And I don't know anything about him because he attended my uh, lecture. I just know that he looks very royal. Mm -hmm. So I started to talk to him and he spoke uh, limited English. So I, I spoke to the guy next to me. His name is uh, Dr. Wang. And he spoke perfect uh, Chinese and English. So through translation, we were able to have a good conversation. And I found out that he was the direct descendant of the Yellow Emperor. And so we had a big talk. And then he, he was very puzzled. And he was kind of pleasantly surprised that I was able to tune into his energy. So he, eventually, he invited me to his hotel. He stayed in the, somewhere in Jack London Square. And he wanted to show me the Dragon Pearl. So I actually saw wow. this thing. I actually have a, a fake one I can show you real quick. Okay, let's see it. And for the, for the audience, it is my understanding that the, the Yellow Emperor existed around the 2700 BC. That is one of the pearls? Or that's, well, that's no, a, no, no, no. This is a, a fake a representation. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This and was it that size? That. Oh, no, it's smaller than this. Okay. But this one, it, it lights up. But so I held it and it was luminous. Mm -hmm. And uh, when my wife, she also went too. When she held it, she felt like electricity in her body. And when I held it, he also did some uh, rituals. And then he did a kind of a two minute or something. He touched me with some kind of oil. And then uh, somehow I just, my consciousness just went back in time. It's like zipped back in time. And I saw a couple of people. I saw, I think it was Ajang Li. He was a famous Buddhist master in Thailand. And then it was Buddha, Gautama Buddha. And then the Yellow Emperor. Somehow there was some kind of connection. So it's it interesting because we not only had that experience, I, I, I had that experience, my wife had the experience. He did a ritual, kind of, I don't know, maybe a Taoist ritual. He had my wife and I do a ritual. And somehow after that ritual, my consciousness merged with my wife's consciousness. I was no longer me. She was no longer herself. We just merged to one. It was like weird. It was like we're into this void of pure consciousness. And it, all, it took a little while. And then after that, we separated our we got back to our own body somehow. It was, it was the weirdest thing. So how long did this last? How this merging? How long did it last? It was like minutes, okay. maybe three or five minutes. And then after that, we just felt like so much connection. It was like giving birth to a twin flame, you know, where one soul splits. That was the feeling we got. But it was incredible because it gave my wife kind of like a psychic ability after that situation. Really? Yeah, she, we would be separate and she could tune into my consciousness and she could feel what I'm feeling. And that happened for a while, but after a while, it kind of just fizzled out. But the fact that we had that experience in the presence of this Dragon Pro was uh, amazing. 
So you said that originally there were seven dragon pearls? Yeah, yeah. So he, he has them, but he has to kind of separate them, hide them in different countries. Understood. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me that there's seven of them. It made me immediately think of seven chakras. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It's a special number. It's okay. So you've met this person who is a direct descendant of the Yellow Emperor. And I said to the audience while you were retrieving the pearl that I think that he existed around 2700 BC. Right. And so flash forward to today, now we are in the year of the wooden dragon. And so we have the symbol of the dragon, which is an ancient symbol, as we've been talking about, perhaps a real creature or a mythical creature. Oh, well, but we also... say one more thing. Sure, please. Yeah, so the, the, I was there at the conference and one presenter was talking about the dragon. He had a picture, I think it was from the Chinese newspaper, and it, was, it looks like it was a skeleton of the dragon. But during the war, somehow it was believed that it was taken away somewhere in Japan. So somebody owned it somewhere. So it was kind of like a validation about that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but anyways, the, the, the wood dragon is it's based on like the element theory. There's like five elements in Chinese yes. medicine. The dragon itself is an auspicious creature it's for good luck and fertility and success. But you have the wood element. Wood element is like a tree, represents growth. And a tree, you know, the wood you can throw in the fire it represents transformation. So this is a year of transformation. This is a year of growth, opportunities for business, for careers. It's an opportunity to manifest things. It also represents a, a new beginning. In fact, my, my third book, as you know, is called A New Beginning. And I, I wrote Antidote that. Antidote for Civilization. That's right. Because we are entering a new era of civilization, you know, we went through this whole massive uh, pandemic that changed our reality. When I wrote the book, I had no idea that was happening. And by the way, when I write books, it's not, I sit down and write books. I get downloads. And that's when I know I want to have to write. So I, this is my third book. Actually, the, Do you uh, write, do you have automatic writing when you say you get these downloads? Because I've heard you say this in, in other interviews. Is it, is it a form of automatic writing or do you get the idea uh, and then you sit down to write it? Yeah, I get the idea first. It's like okay. I could be sleeping, I could be driving, and I, and I get this, this, this information of knowledge. And it, it just stays there. And if I don't write it down, it just drives me crazy. So then as soon as I can do it, I pull over and I start writing. Or sometimes I'll turn on my recorder and I'll talk to my recorder what's being downloaded to my mind. And then I write it down later on. But if I don't, it, it, it keeps on happening over and over. So when all the information is completed, it just stops. Then I know that the book is complete. So all my books are like that. And uh, after my first book, I thought I was done. But again, I, I keep on getting downloaded a few years later for my second book. So I said, okay, I, I did my work and I'm, I'm done. And then all of a sudden this happens. And then the, all the information is about health, wellness, nutrition. I said, why am I writing about this? You know? And now in retrospect, you, know, you look at the pandemic and all that yes. crisis happened. And now I realize that I think the universe was trying to prepare humanity and give them the tools to navigate through the crisis more gracefully. So pretty, it's, it looks like a health book, like an encyclopedia, like a resource book. But actually, if you really understand it, it's a, it's a spiritual book supporting humanity's evolution and birth into this new era, new beginning. Like right now, this new beginning of the new year at, what, to uh, February 10th. Yes. Where the planet is, is waking up more so. And then we just have to evolve further and connect with all those visionary people, humanitarian people, spiritual people, but work together as, as, a, as a unity to bring about this transformation in the planet. The COVID years and I mean, they were very difficult and on other shows, I've talked a great deal about this and it is my feeling that Western medicine and pharmaceuticals really failed us because we became very draconian in the measures that we chose to fight back against this thing. And what draws me to your work and, and, and many alternative healing, mod healing modalities is that there are other ways to look at things besides a surgical procedure besides a pharmaceutical besides putting someone in a bed in a um, corporate hospital and much of your book is about all of these different modalities so again let's talk a, a little bit about because you you talk about chinese medicine and chinese medicine 
I'm learning this because you you mentioned the the five elements or the four elements. Talk a little bit about what those elements are and how they are utilized in Chinese medicine. Well, the five elements are like the wood element, the water element, the fire element, and the air. Air, yeah. yeah, and fire. So yeah. they they look at that. I mean, I'm not an expert in that, but from my understanding, they look at these elements and the relationship between the elements. And there's a temporal component, and there's also a seasonal component. And they they look at the organs. The organs are, have certain elements too, like the livers is a kind of a wood element. Yes. And, and so by looking at that relationship, you can kind of work on treatment plans of uh, how to help somebody. Like the relationship between the wood, you know, and and the the fire element and the water and the metal element. So Chinese medicine is very holistic, and they look at that in terms of the the energy flow in the body, the uh, qi, and that's the major thing they look at the the qi in the organs, and then they look at the the balance between the yin and yang energy. So a lot of times they can kind of ask questions. They can look at your tongue and assess the integrity of your organs just by the color of your tongue. Um, and they can also feel the pulse. They can tell if there's too much yang energy or, or, or maybe not enough yin energy. So they can get an idea of what types of herbs would help or what type of exercise would help to improve the qi flow. So a lot of the focus is on qi flow using the element theory, using herbs to help, using acupuncture to clear those qi blockages and the qi goes through the meridian channels supplying the body, the, the, the energy highway. And a qigong master can see these qi, the energy. They can see where there's a dysfunction. They can fix it. Conversely, they can also look at you and they can also damage you with a slight touch of a finger if they wanted to. I have a story about that. My cousin was a, is a martial artist and he studied with a famous Kung Fu master from China, Master Wong, and then Wong Tim Yun. And his grandmaster was a famous Shaolin master in China. And we talk about the real thing, the real Kung Fu, real martial art. And one time he, he migrated and lived in San Francisco and he opened a laundromat. And usually back in the day, when you say you're a martial art master, Kung Fu master, people come up and say, hey, they want to challenge you and see how good you are. So the guy comes, hey, I want to fight with you. Of course, his master is humble. He says, no, I don't want to fight. So this guy keeps on doing it over and over. Finally, the, you know, the last time he, this master had it, he said, okay, you, you protect yourself, okay? And after that, you go get yourself checked out because you, you're going to be hurt really bad. So then, so then this master came real fast and he just touched him. And there's a thing in Chinese called dim muk. Dim means touch. Muk is like a point. Yes. And the guy didn't feel anything, but he went to see a doctor Doctor said, you know what, you're, you have massive bleeding, you're going to die. And if you don't take care of yourself, you will die. So he said, whoever did this to you, they have a special like martial art. You got to go back to that person because he has the antidote to cure you. Hmm. And so it's, it's probably Chinese medicine doctor who, who figured that out. And so the guy went back with a roast duck and said, I'm so sorry, I apologize. And this guy became the first disciple in San Francisco. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they talk about amazing martial art. Well, I, I've I've heard of this type of thing where with one touch they can uh, make you or knock you out, make you very yeah. ill or whatever. It's interesting to me the idea of meridians and chi exist because I've never had acupuncture. I've had acupressure and things like that, but then you expand beyond the body into the planet, which is one of the things you talk about. That there's because we talk about ley lines and and. It seems like most many sacred sites were built on ley lines. So these meridians and these energy points on the body, we seem to also have them on the planet. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's a good observation. Everything, in my, in my opinion, that happens inside our inner universe, a body is just a temple. It, it replicates. So what's happening here, we have chakras in the body. You talk about ley lines, acupuncture points. Yes. Same thing on Earth, we have these chakras on the planet Earth too. In various mountains but then you go to the planets same thing it just repeats itself repeats itself over and over again it's a pattern so you know all, all this thing is amazing because there's, there's some kind of divine orchestration going on here affecting our internal dynamics affecting our chi affecting our prana affecting how our body heals 
like that's what, wise. Yeah. Well, and that's what that's what fascinates me because within Chinese medicine, we have chi, with Ayurvedic medicine, we have prana. And while they're not the same thing, they are similar. And, and in Chinese medicine, we have um, meridians and the dantian. And then in Ayurvedic, we have the chakras. Explain what the dantians are as well, because I didn't know any of this until I picked up your book. Well, dantian, most people refer to the dantian as like a reservoir of energy. And most people say it's by your navel. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of them. That's a major one. But there's other ones too. That's that's a lower one. There's a upper one by your pineal gland, the third eye, and there's one in by your heart. And these are kind of like places where there's energy. But the big one is by your navel area. And that's one that gives you energy for life. And uh, according to Grandmaster Mantachia, is a, one of the most famous healer in the world. That that area, that chi, is is connected to the mesentery. The mesentery it kind of holds on to the organs, to the to the intestines, to the the abdomen, and that whole area in the dantian is like a battery pack. So through Taoist practice, through some qigong practices, it's like you're, you're, you're turning that battery on, you're charging it, and that gives you that vital force energy to do things. So do like a chamber exercises, do qigong exercises. You can activate that, recharge that battery pack. So we have more qi and more energy. And then, then pro, I, one of the other questions that I, I know the audience may have, because I've had it as well, and I've done some yoga classes, but I never fully understood the difference between qi or prana. You know, if you ask most healers, they would probably say they're one and the same. Right. That's what they say. They say, well, prana is from Japan. Uh, no, sorry. Prana is from India. Right. Chi is from Japan. Chi is from China. But upon deeper analysis, I began to realize that there are subtle differences. And, and the, to me, it, it stands out that the one, one is more, to me, is more dense. And the other one is more subtle. I think the the chi, if you're a chico master, you can actually see the chi. You know, as I mentioned before, Whereas the, I think the prana energy is more subtle. It's kind of like subtle energy, like the aura. Mm -hmm. You can't you see it. Most people can't. You know, unless you're a very specialized a shaman or something, maybe you can see that. But the average person can't see that. And it's kind of like superimposed on the central nervous system. And it, and it goes through the nadis. And there's like the three major nadis that it goes through. So with the prana energy, from my understanding, is that it goes through these nadis channel, three major ones, just like the... The Dantian three major ones, but it's, it's the, the Nadis. And one of them is, I think, in the central canal. It goes, like I think, from the spine to probably the cervical area. And then the other one goes to the crown chakra. And then the other one is, somehow goes through the nostrils. So it's very important. That's why they have pranayama breathing. They do an alternating nasal breathing to activate it, to bring balance. And I think there's a two components to it. It's like one there's a sun component, there's a warm heat. One's a moon component. So it's activated through the breathing, you know, through asanas, it activates it through the meditation, through all these breathing exercises, through a visualization and breathing at the same time, circulating that prana energy, you know, the kundalini energy. So I think it's, a, it's a different to me than the, the uh, chi. The chi, I think they, they kind of together, work together. Mm -hmm. So then going back to the prana, it kind of twists and turns through the, the central canal. Yep. creating these plexus or these chakras, seven major chakras, energy points, vortexes, if you will. But there's more than that. Some people say 13, some people say 108. But wow, yeah, realistically, we, we have chakras everywhere. I mean, all the acupuncture points are, are chakras, basically. So, but seven is enough when you work on that, you, you get good health. If you're feeling lousy, you, you get Reiki done, you work on all that balance, you feel great. But sometimes you want to do higher consciousness, you have to work on different ones. So each of them has a different color, different name, and different function. Wherever it's located, it will affect the different parts of that body and the organs. So by maintaining the integrity of it, making sure it flows through the breathing exercise, through energy work, prana healing, you, you obtain health. Whereas in the uh, qi gong, I mean, the qi, it, you have blockages you have to have a more direct approach, like an acupuncture to open that uh, point, to clear it. So it goes to the organs for healing. 
healing in terms of balancing the organ in terms of the yin and yang energy. So kind of a little bit different perspective, similar but different. But I think inside everything is all kind of intertwined together. But one is like, to me, is more affected through the breathing of breath. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, even Qigong, you, you can use your, your breath too. But that one to me is a more applied to uh, some physical contact. You get acupressure, which is the older form, and then you get acupuncture, which is a newer form. And I think before that, they have radiant circuit using energies in a different way. By the way, the most current one is the acupuncture. So and they, they also use cupping techniques too. Yes. So definite approaches, but you know, it's, it's helping to bring harmony in the body. In your many years of studying from many traditions and many teachers, was there one that stood out as being particularly enlightening or um, positive for you, or do they all work together to bring you to where you are now? Oh, in, in influencing me in terms yes. of my practice? Yes. You know, I, I think they all play a different role. I study hypnosis. So through that, I learned the subconsciousness. And I study Reiki. Mm -hmm. So it, it just helps me to bring it all to one platform of holistic healing. So it gives me a situation where I can look at somebody and find out the problem and find out what's the best modality for them. Because if all you have is a nail, you can only use a nail. But if you have all these different tools, you know, and humanity, people are so complex, complex problems. And people think it's just a physical problem. You got a physical body, you got an emotional body. You got a mental body, you got a spiritual body, and most people neglect that. We have spiritual energies, and, and we have our pineal gland that needs to be taken care of, and we have all these vortexes that need to be taken care of. We have all these nadis that need to be taken care of, and, and the chi. But when we neglect that, you know, we just think we're just exercising, eating good, that's good enough, but it's, it's more than that. And there's a nutritional component that people miss too. I mean, big time, like minerals, most people don't have enough minerals in the body. We have 102 minerals in the body, and most people don't get it. They, they say, okay, I'm going to eat some apples and fruits. The problem is that in the soil, it's so deficient in the minerals because of mass production, you know, that we're not getting it. So then they say, I'll get a little supplement. And maybe they'll get like 10, 15 minerals. That's deficient. So most diseases, according to one doctor, is that underlying all the diseases is a deficiency in the mineral. So that's one of the most important things right now, the mineral that you take. So I take a vulvic mineral at 72, thinking that's high, and it helped a lot. But then I discovered Iris sea moss, which has 92. When I switched to that, I found a big difference in how I felt. There was a particular mineral that you mentioned, I believe, in Chapter 6, related to uh, mental health, especially for depression. I'm trying think, to find... Uh, lithium orate. Yes, I have never heard of this before. Talk about it. I think it's a type of salt, but in small amounts, it can help you to elevate and balance your, how you feel. So the, I think there's some places they even put it in the water because of the population is a high amount of suicide. And then they're trying to pacify people, kind of stabilize their, their mind a little bit. It's not, I think there's a medicine with lithium carbonate, but this is right. a very mild form to bring some balancing. But well, that's uh, something easy you can use. Yeah, because so many of us, I used to be on antidepressants. I'm no longer on them. I was on, on Zoloft. Mm -hmm. And so I've always found these idea is interesting. I'm getting up there in years and I want to keep my brain as clear as possible. And I've also had depression in my family. So when I saw this, it, it stuck out to me and it wasn't something that I had heard of before. There, there's so many things out there. I mean, after I wrote the book, I, I just I just keep learning more and more stuff. It's just incredible the technology that exists out there to help you. There's a machine I wrote in the book about the Achna light. In one session, I mean, if you're feeling lousy, like the end of the world, you have one session, you come out feeling like you just had a vacation. Which light is it? Is this the uh, rapid? Is this the rapid eye thing? No, no, no. This is the you know, yeah. It's flashing light when you, when you look at it, but then when you close your eye, your brain creates all these ge geometric patterns, and somehow it balances out your brain. So the, actually, the Ajna light is kind of a laziest person the med meditation, but it's a neural light that helps balance out for the depression or anxiety. I, I see people before and after, it's like night and day, totally different person. And only a few minutes, five, 10 minute treatment and, and you're, boom, you feel it's natural. Incredible. Yeah, but there's so many, so many supplements and so many like things like ma even magnesium, you know, most of us are deficient. 
when you get enough magnesium, you're less anxious and you're less depressed. You have St. John's War, you have Rescue Remedy. There's so many things out there nowadays to support you. In the Indian tradition, they have ashwagandha that helps you relax yes. more. But the best thing I tell you is exercise. Just yes. do like 30 to 45 minutes of exercise. Do salsa, dancing, do ping pong. According to Dr. Amen, the brain specialist, these are two of the best exercises for depression. Interesting. I, I had depression many years and I did that. Boom. Felt great. Because you're, you're busy learning something and you, it's, you, you move yourself from thinking over and over and your, your brain creates new pathways. You said salsa dancing and ping pong. <laughs> ping pong. That's what he said. And he's well, an expert well, in the brain. Well, that's interesting to me because in both cases, they require a high amount of cord, hand-eye coordination yes, that's right, that's versus right. just exercising. Like I, I went to the gym this morning to kind of wake up and get the things flowing, but I was not doing things that required a great deal of coordination. They, yeah. I'm on the treadmill, then I'm lifting some weight. So it was, I was exercising, but I wasn't doing those things. I mean, those things help too, but when you do these more complicated things, it, it enhances the, how you feel. It and makes also, sense. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing, too, is uh, a lot of people neglect the gut. Yes. Yes. And that affects how we feel. So a lot of the stuff we eat destroys our gut microbiome. And if you take an antibiotic, it's like a nuclear bomb. Wipes out all the bad bacteria as well as a good one. And so the, the gut is our second brain. So if that's not working, it's not sending the signals to create serotonin to help you feel better. It communicates with it. And if you're not taking care of that, it starts to make your brain inflamed, creating dementia. Dementia is the, now going to be called like the type, the third type, the diabetes type three, you know, because it's sugar based type of disorder created by sugar. Sugar is like a, the evil in the nutritional world. It feeds cancer and it also feels the, the dementia acceleration of it. I a lot of the diseases. That. Yeah. So if you, the carbohydrates basically. So when you break down carbs, they become glucose and then and that becomes sugar. So if you can change that part of it and, and, and also work on the microbiome and making sure that you're having your probiotic and prebiotic. And probiotic is not all created equal. You have to find a good one. Most of so when, when something comes out good, everybody jumps on the bandwagon and tries to sell it in a cheap price. They'll get it from some country to make it real cheap quality mm -hmm. because it's about profit. But if you get a good one, the difference between the good one and the bad one is that the good one goes to the gut. Most of the cheap one is, yes, it is a probiotic, but it goes to the stomach acid and gets killed. Mm -hmm. No use. Even yogurt, there's a lot of uh, the, the people advertise they have a probiotic, but they've been pasteurized, so it's dead. So there's no use too. So you want something that uh, is good quality that goes into where it's supposed to go and starts to uh, give you the strain that you need. So that's the basic, starting with a good uh, probiotic. But once you want to get to a more advanced level, then you want to test yourself and find out. There's test kits you can do. And there's a doctor, Dr. Grace Liu. She can test you. She's a gut specialist. They, they call her the gut goddess. Uh, she can test you and find out what specific bacteria your gut needs. That way you get the right one. Yeah, you get the right one for your microbiome. And your brain will be better. Your body will be better. Your inflammation will go down. You'll be happier too. So if you look at it in terms of this kind of holistic approach, you get a better outcome. So you'd say, well, take a lithium orotate. Well, that's one thing, which is great. But I find my practice uh, getting from a different angle, from an exercise angle, you know, from hydration angle, from meditation, all these things combined, you get longer lasting outcomes. What do you think about the rise in autoimmune diseases over the last 20 to 30 years? Because like I, I have Crohn's disease and I'm on a medication for it, but I can't help but feel that it, it seemed like for years they couldn't diagnose it as exactly what it was. And I know that I'm not in the only person in this situation, but but there has been a rise in autoimmune diseases in general, it seems to me, in the last 25 to 30 years. Yeah. I, I feel that it's a lot of it has to do with our nutrition. Yeah. And our, our food is so corrupted. You know, all, all our fruits and vegetables has got sprayed with pesticide and that's damaging to the microbiome and our diet. You know, we have the most obese people in the world. So a lot of it's carbs and, and bad fats and all that's corrupting our system, causing inflammation. Sugar causes inflammation. And so, and also the stress, our lifestyle, of all the things that happened in the past two years with the pandemic, people's stress level is up the wall, up the ceiling. Over a long period of time, it creates cortisol, the stress hormone. And then that shuts down the immune system. 
And then in our body, inherently, we have all these viruses that are living there normally. But when your immune system is shut down, they, they become active. And the problem is that our air has been polluted with all these uh, heavy metals, our water is mm -hmm. polluted, everything is polluted. So then we, we're accumulating all this heavy metal. Once it gets in, it doesn't get out, unless you do some kind of a protocol to release it, a detoxification. So what happens is that your immune system shuts down, and then these uh, viruses are activated, and they eat these metal, heavy metals, and they poop, causes inflammation. So I think a lot of it has to do with nutrition, the, the sugar, all that is part of it, and all the toxins in the air. So we need to basically do detoxification through like fasting, water fasting, juice fasting, or I mean, I even include social media fasting. All, all these things sure. are affecting us. So we need to cleanse our body through the process of autophagy. We clean our system of all these additives they put into the food, these food colorings, these chemicals that make us want to eat the food. So all those things are destroying us. So we have to get back to basic, eating real food, things we grow or things that is organic. And organic, we think is safe, but they, they still spray a little bit. So you sure. still, if you get organic food, you still have to clean it. So you just go for cleaner food and then minimize your sugar, your glucose, and carbs and uh, have a more plant-based diet and work on your microbiome because a lot of these things destroy it and people end up getting a leaky gut syndrome and that uses the lining of the gut. So if you look at all that, dietary-wise, a lot of these things can be resolved I think the medical medium, he talks about a lot of these mystery diseases, so the autoimmune problems. Yes. Epstein-Barr virus is one of those things that is hard to diagnose in, in you know, fibromyalgia. So a lot of these things are triggered by these uh, the viruses in the, in the body. And so if you, you can minimize the stress, change our diet, take some supplements that decrease the inflammation, there's a possibility that you can live a more productive life and minimize these types of uh, disease from progressing or maybe even slow it down, you know, or you know, put it to a halt. In your practice, are there certain types of conditions you're seeing more of now than you used to? I see a lot of dementia. And again, it goes in with the dietary things and there's a lot of strokes, a lot of heart disease because it's all dietary. Yeah. And everybody, the problem is that everybody wants to get a quick solution. They go see whoever practitioner they see and they give them like a pill. They take that and think that's a solution. That's just something to kind of pacify you. That's not a solution. The solution is what you're putting in your mouth. Nobody yes. wants to say, hey, you can't eat that pizza. You can't drink that beer, you know, and it's a damaging your liver and all that. They don't want to hear that. They want to have a good time. They want yes. to have a Super Bowl party, have a giant pizza. I mean, in moderation is okay. But for some people, they're trying to save money and if they eat these fast food, it means that if you have fast food, it's, short, it's, it's the faster you expiration date for yourself and your body because our body needs real food. We, we need food that has minerals in it. We need things that have vitamins in it. We need things that have organic energy in it, that prana energy. So we don't need artificial food. The world is going through this GMO, fake food, and they're making food that looks like a real food, but they're not real. The, our body's not designed for that, and it's going to react to it by making you sick. So if you look from a nutritional standpoint and from balancing the energies and all that detoxification. That's one of the most important things. You have to clean your body, go to spa, clean your body. You, you sweat it out. You, you fast to, you know, the, for me, intermittent fasting is great, but sometimes I have to do water fasting too. Mm -hmm. because I want a, a greater cleanse. And I don't just do regular water because water doesn't have anything in it. Sometimes you have to put a little mineral because water, you know, if you get the water from tap water, it's the worst. It's got the yes. fluoride. Calci calcifies your pineal gland. It has all these chemicals in it. You have to get a certain type of filtration system if you want to hydrate. You need, your body is so much water inside, so you need to get quality water and maybe put a little Himalayan salt or put a Celtic salt you know, for electrolytes. And salt, not the table salt. I mean, that's really like really bad quality. But Celtic salt you put in there, and the water gets into the cell better. Could you, could you describe what you think is the most valuable water fasting method? Um, I think the intermittent one is uh, probably the easiest for people to do. You know, it's like 16 hours you um, don't eat. And during the eight hour window, you can eat, you know, reasonably. You not eat like the, all the heavy junk food. That one is the more doable. And uh, while you're fasting, maybe drink the water with the uh, minerals in it or maybe a little Celtic salt. 
otherwise you're going to end up getting headaches and so forth. So that to me was one of the easiest things to do. And then later on, and some people do juice fasting too. Yes. That, that's pretty easy. But I, I, to me, I like the intermittent fasting or just the regular water fasting with the minerals, a little Celtic salt, and then do that uh, maybe a day. And sometimes, you know, you need three days. It depends on your lifestyle. If you're eating junk food all the time, you probably need to have more days. But maybe at least maybe once or twice a year, you should do three to three to five days of water fasting. Some people even say it's okay to have black coffee. But in my opinion, if you're going to do it, you have to have organic coffee because there's some benefits to it too. But yes. the better if you can stick to, to clean water, kind of water that's energized, structured water, yeah, machines that mix structured water, there's a cardinal water, something like that. The more you do that, the better is hydration for you. And then during the eight-hour window, then you can have some food. It is my understanding you mentioned coffee, and I, I love my coffee, but to grind your coffee is better because some of the, the coffees that are already pre-ground have mycotoxins in them. Have you ever heard that? I haven't heard that, but in general, I, I kind of don't drink too much coffee only on the weekends because mm -hmm. uh, most of them, they have pesticide. And the, you know, you, when you take the coffee, you grind it, you, you take it in your body. So if you do do it, just do the organic one. It's better for you. Understood. You mentioned also the pineal gland. I want to spend a minute on that because this is one of those things that I've always um, heard about the calcified pineal gland, but I've never looked into how to actually decalcify it. So you're saying this is a thing. It's a, it's a real thing that it becomes decal it becomes calcified and we can decalcify it. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Well, I think uh, you can do things the, the most, the cheapest thing, the most inexpensive thing is the sun gazing. And by sun gazing in the morning, you know, maybe 20, 30 seconds, you know, kind of looking at when the first sun comes up, it, it helps activate the pineal gland. In fact, if you're having trouble sleeping, it, it helps it because the pineal gland produces melatonin and it, it helps to reset the circadian rhythm for your sleep patterns. So you, mentioned, you mentioned sun gazing in the book. Now, what do people may be asking, okay, we're imagining you're saying sun gazing. So are you saying stare directly at the sun? Because that seems dangerous, but well, or do you, or do you of, mean just look around at it? I, I would kind of, I myself, I kind of look at it and it kind of gaze away, you know, sure. just keep the general direction as tolerated. And yes. Some people have very sensitive eyes. So listen to your body essentially yeah. for about 20, 30 seconds, whatever you can tolerate. So look at it a little bit, but you can feel that the light is coming and maybe in an in, in, indirect way for 20, 30 seconds. So that's, that's how I would do, do it. Because sometimes you know, look through loans, it's, it's too strong for me. Sure. So I just kind of, redirect my gaze okay so sun, so gaze, one way. Yeah. sun gazing is one way so taking wild blueberries is another way mm. yeah that's very helpful for your brain function really you know? yeah and then also taking like purple reishi you can get a which is a mushroom yeah a mushroom that i think they have that dragonherbs.com it's, it's a nice place to get a lot of herbal supplements and that's the la store i think it's owned by ron teagarden and a lot of celebrities go to his place to get good quality herbs, supplements. You mentioned him in the book quite a few times. Yeah. Ron T. Garden. Yeah, he has like really good goji berries. It's got some of the kind of exotic herbs and so forth. And he has the best tea there, the dragon herb tea. And it's touted as the healthiest tea in the world. People in China who have long life, they find out they have, they drink this tea that has a certain ingredient in there that's in this dragon herb tea. So that's a, a good one. They, they use it as a base. So when you go to their like herbal bar, they add the other elixirs into it. They might put a chi drop to strengthen your energy so that you can be a rock star, or they may have other things to help you relax a little bit more. And they have things to help the different energies in our body. You know, we have jin energy, chi, and those balancing our energy helps us to feel better, to have more life force, and to be able to be more productive. In this year ahead of us, this, this 2024 wooden dragon year, are there particular things that you would say would be good for us to ingest, particularly in this year, to be in congruence with the, the energy of the year? Well, I, I think just because our food chain is so toxic, I yeah. think we, we should try to eat more towards a plant-based diet and, sure. and, and eat a clean, cleaner food, real food. Find things that are not contaminated if you can. That's the, probably the best thing you can do. It seems like diets come along a few years ago. The keto diet was the big thing. And I was, you know, I was doing some of that. But basically, it sounds to me like what you're really saying is just 
just eat good foods, not a particular branch of the four food chart, but but just eat good organic food. Yeah, and just like like if you're gonna eat fish, don't get any farm raised fish because they they put all the fish together, put antibiotics in there, and that's gonna eat your body. Yeah, you're gonna get chicken, get organic chicken, and make sure they don't put antibiotic in there. And then if you're gonna you know have fruits, you know just try to make sure you you wash them even because they they all spray with some kind of chemicals. So I mean you can go deeper in depending on your blood type. You know some people need more meat, mm -hmm. some people need more vegetables. So um, you have to kind of listen to your own body rhythm. And so, like I, I talk about the ion wellness method, the system that, that I yes, developed. let's talk about that. And, and it's basically talking about the I am is the sacred word of God. When the they were asking God, what's His name? He says, I am. So I am is that divine presence within us. You cut your finger, your your body knows what to do. It goes to heal itself. So there's this kind of divine orchestration. So the idea is that. You have the universe, you have the creator, you have God, whatever you want to call it. It's anchored to you in your heart, chakra. And it's like a gateway. And through that uh, process, it's animating all the healing inside the body. And so if we're eating the wrong food, and we're not putting the nutrients in the body, it's having a hard time healing. If you're flushing it all with the GMOs and heavy metal, you're going to destroy your microbiome. So microbiome is like the Garden of Eden. And if you don't take care of that, you're going to be a sad person. You're going to have constipation. You're going to have, you know, maybe early dementia. So the whole idea is that I look at the element theory too, but in a different context than Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine. In that I, I do the like the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air. And the air actually I think is more of Ayurvedic medicine, not not Chinese medicine. But earlier when you mentioned air, yeah, yeah that's a more Indian. And so the air element and the metal element, but I look at it differently in terms of the earth element. I look at the microbiome, the gut as kind of uh, needing the nutrients of mother earth, you know, for the, for the earth element and the metals, I mean, not metals, the minerals. During the COVID years, was there anything that you were telling people to do in particular? Because everybody was wondering, well, my God, what do we do? What do we do? And I was following the Zelenko protocol, I was using HCQ and I was using Ivermectin. Different people did different things. And I'm not telling anybody to do something, but what was your approach to? to well, at the beginning, it was uh, new to everybody, including myself. And sure. I, I came up with my own formulation. And uh, But now in retrospect, you can simplify things. And basically what I was doing is boosting the immune system. And 100%. One of the, yep. Yeah, but one of the things is taking like zinc and yes. getting like zinc glycinate. And taking that, and that that basically blocks the virus from replicating. But you need to get something to zinc into the cell. So something like an EECG or something like, like, like that can help to bring the, um, the zinc into the cell. And then you block it from replicating. The elderberry juice, you know, you think that that also helps to block the virus from replicating. High doses of vitamin C, mm -hmm. getting, a, getting them some a vitamin C that's a better absorption. Vitamin D is good for the immune system. You know, they were telling us to stay inside, but the reality is that we should be going outside to get sun exposure to create vitamin D in our body. Yes. A lot of the recommendations were actually destroying our immune system. So, you know, I was telling people, I said, go outside, have a walk, you know, and then boost up your vitamin D because people were working indoors and then they're making themselves even weaker in terms of the immune system. So vitamin D, vitamin A, also for the immune system, vitamin C, and then the, the zinc and then the elderberry. And there was also pathogen assassin, but they, I think they went out of business, but it's basically like a colloidal silver, a, a stronger version of it. But nowadays there's so many things out there you can take, but that's a antibacterial, antiviral. So by doing that, you, you increase your way to navigate it without having too much complication. It's really not that serious. It's only people who have a compromised immune system and sure. don't do anything about it. And by staying indoors, you're making your immune system worse because you're not getting the vitamin you need from the sun. So you know, just exercise and so forth, being active and being around people. People stop seeing each other. They stop hugging each other. And that when you hug, it creates a chemical in your body, makes you feel good. We are human beings. We're social creatures. We, we need that. So we were doing like the opposite of all the things we should be doing. I, I kept on doing it and, and I was okay. You know, and then when I had it, it was like it came and left. Because I knew how to deal with it and I knew what I was dealing with. I had it as well for about four or five days. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, it it wasn't fun by any means. It it did suck for the couple of days I had it, and it did leave me with a cough for about a week and a half. But I got through it, and no, I was just curious, and I I hope that we will learn from that experience going forward because I'm sure it's not the last time that we will encounter a situation like this. Yeah, it's going to happen again, and that's the purpose of the book is that to, to arm us with wisdom and knowledge, and to realize that you can't depend on some authority figure out there telling you what to do. You got to learn about your health. In the book, I teach you how to think, how to be critical. You can't just grab any kind of supplements because they're not all created equal. You have to get the, the right company. There's, everybody's copying everybody. So if you learn about how to think, understand that your immune system comes from your gut and understand how that works, understand what decreases inflammation, what, what fights the viruses, and you know, even but even the Wi-Fi has a factor in all this. You know, yes. that's why so many yeah, and people in China had had uh, died from it because that's a basically like a, like a giant microwave. So when you have that, and then you have poor air quality, you have stress, and then you have a virus, then you're predisposed to getting sick real fast, and then and your immune system is already compromised, and then you end up dying. So if you can minimize that, you know, less exposure to the EMF. I think in China, they, they make it a law nowadays that if you're pregnant, you have to wear something to protect yourself because they know that it harms. And people are totally oblivious nowadays to these things. They, well, well, they have, they have, uh -huh. Sir Blake, they people here in the West, we're told that's just crazy. That's nonsense. I mean, you're hearing about th these things. And I, I don't think that we are up on our information on that. I think that we're told to just ignore those types of things. Right, right, right. Just like people were telling us that cigarettes good for you back in the day, and now they're telling me you know, <laughs> now you realize that you get cancer. But you know, you have to do your own research, and and the fact is that you you have these Wi-Fi at home, you have it in a smart cars, and they affect you, yes. and you, you have to protect yourself. And if you don't, it's gonna start working your immune system down, bringing you down, and you start getting all types of issues, a lot of health issues, Sir headaches, Blake. You know, cancer. Mm -hmm. Sir Blake Sinclair, thank you so much for your time today. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is A New Beginning, An Antidote to Civilization. It's actually the third book of a trilogy. Sir Blake Sinclair, the, the website is blakesinclair.org. Where else can people find out more about you and, and maybe find you on social media or wherever you're at? Yeah, yeah, I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook, um, Blake Sinclair. Uh, Instagram is Sir Blake underscore Sinclair author. Excellent. Gotcha. Okay, that's the IG. Well, well, the wooden dragon, we will see what, what happens. It's an interesting time to be alive. Yeah, but I encourage everybody to open their mind to kind of see the future they want to create. And this is a year of manifestation. So, you know, you can see it, you create it. And we're part of that expansive consciousness. So right now, the, the universe is working in our favor, especially in this year. There was one yogi who was saying that this is the end of the Kali Yoga era based on his calculations and, and, and it happened on that day of the new year. That's why he was excited about it. But regardless, I, I think uh, the energy in, in the planet is shifting towards that way. So em embrace it and, and don't live in fear anymore. Just uh, know that each one of us can make a difference in raising the whole consciousness of the planet just by what, what we think, how we feel and uh, where we are in our level of um, consciousness in terms of if we're living in love or living in fear or living in enlightenment, a person living in a state of enlightenment consciousness can affect millions of people. People living in the state of love can affect 150,000 people, according to uh, Dr. Hawk's uh, uh, map of consciousness. So, I mean, just being in that state and positively, positively influence the people around you and the planet. So, I mean, just even that alone is pretty impressive and amazing. So, just be the best version of yourself. But you know, in terms of taking care of yourself, don't neglect yourself, you know, and do those things you need to do for feng shui or for astrology or just take care of yourself, taking care of your chi, your prana energy, meditate, live a good life. Sir Blake Sinclair, thank you so much for joining us today. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening and continuing to listen to Michael Parker Media. And if you could, if you could just give us a, a like or a thumbs up on your platform of choice. It goes a long way. It helps me a lot. Share this, this information with your family and friends. And a reminder that Sir Blake Sinclair's book is, his latest book, A New Beginning, 
an antidote to civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Until next time, keep your thank heart you. Thank you. and your mind open. Peace.